Well, hello, welcome to uh, this episode, which I'm gonna call The Fishmonger's Kitchen. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dancefish.com, and today I'm going to be refreshing a couple live food cultures to make some uh, awesome food for my aquarium fish. So, I'm gonna show you how I do that. I'm gonna start with the easiest one. We're gonna do two cultures today. One is vinegar eels, which are these tiny, not actually eels, they're just a tiny, tiny little nematode. They live in vinegar and they are awesome for baby fish. And the second one, also for baby fish, is microworms. So we'll start with the vinegar eels and then we'll do the microworms. So basically, what's happened is these cultures are about six months old. They're still producing, but the color of the culture is turning dark. So the um, vinegar mixture in here is getting pretty dark and this is gonna crash at some point. I haven't done a great job keeping up on it. Um, it used to be up to here, it's evaporated this much. If I had kept up refreshing the water that was evaporating, it probably wouldn't be in this kind of shape. But what you do is you just start a new culture using this as the starter source, because this is still full, full, full of vinegar eels. Um, it's not, you know, the culture hasn't crashed yet, but I need to restart it before it does. So, vinegar eels are super easy. All you need is a container to keep some vinegar and water in. Voila. And some kind of food source. Usually I use apple, but we bought these pears from the grocery store the other day, and they're disgusting. <laughs> they're like, they're like chalky and starchy and just not very enjoyable to eat. But I'm sure that the vinegar eels will eat them just fine. So I'm going to use a pear this time. So basically, what you need for vinegar eels is you want about, you need a starter culture, which are these two things right here, these old cultures. You need some vinegar, and it's important that it be live vinegar. So this is the apple cider vinegar, and it's with the mother, which is the living organism that actually makes vinegar a, a, alive. And you kind of need that, because that's one of the things that the vinegar eels are going to eat. Now, in a pinch, you can cheat a little bit and add some distilled white vinegar if you can't find the stuff with mother in it. Um, if you don't have a lot of it, you can add a little bit of that white distilled vinegar to kind of stretch it out just a little bit. But the, the, the vinegar with the mother in it is what you really want. Okay? So I'm going to start six new cultures. I've got a, a big shipment from Nigeria coming in pretty soon. There's some rare tetras in there. There's um, some killifish in there. Um, and I want to spawn some of these fish. So. The killifish, most of them will be big enough as babies to eat baby brine shrimp right away, but I have a feeling that some of the kerosens, uh, tetras, might need vinegar eels to help them get started. So I'm going to make a, a six new cultures so I'm ready for them. Basically what you do is you just fill a jar about halfway, oh let me shake this first. It's been sitting a while this bottle. Alright, there we go. By the way, I'm like in a massive build project right now. I'm building, uh, putting together a 125 gallon tank and a 100 gallon tank and I'm painting and I'm drilling glass and I'm uh, doing all kinds of stuff. So, so that's why I'm wearing these uh, awesome shorts with all the stains on them, just, just so you know. It's a work day here in the fish room. So um, anyway, shook that up. It's about half full with vinegar, okay? All right, and then, super easy, cold water. You don't wanna kill the vinegar eels with heat, um, so you don't wanna use hot water out of the tap, but just some cold water. You fill it just about to the top, so about half full of that. All right. Make sure you can see that, yeah. Okay, good. Then my pear, I'm just gonna cut it into, well, I'm gonna cut that stem off, because that's totally 
like a, it's like a piece of stick that's not going to disintegrate very quickly. Okay, I'm just going to cut this pear into, well, make it eight pieces just because that's easy. And then I just have six cultures. Piece of pear. I have washed this pear just to take off any, I don't know, possible pesticides or anything, but vinegar eels are super tough, so not much is going to kill them. I mean, they can live in vinegar. So drop that in, and what that does is that will slowly release starches and sugars so the vinegar eels have a constant source of food. Now, you can use brown sugar as well, or other things, but then you have to add it like every day because it's not it's kind of all used up really quick and you have to keep replenishing it. The nice thing about pear or apple or something like that is it's this gradual release so it keeps the culture going for a long time. I haven't touched those old cultures for six months and they're still producing a ton of vinegar eels. So, so that's what you do. And then Fish Room's friend, the turkey baster. I'm just going to take a few of these, yeah there's still tons in there, um, I'm going to take a squirt of this from the old culture, put it in the new culture, and voila, there you go. Next thing is coffee filters and a ring, and that will make our top. Okay. So that is how to make a vinegar eel culture. It's that easy. In a week or so, this thing will be absolutely full of vinegar eels. A week or two. Um, okay, so that's vinegar eels. Super easy. Low maintenance. Good food for fry. You can just set them in a dark corner and forget about them, pretty much. Every now and then, if you think about it, just check to make sure that they haven't evaporated quite completely, and you'll be fine. If they have, um, you can replace the evaporation with just more fresh water. And yeah, over time, that's going to be a problem, but you know, we're not trying to keep these eternally. A month, uh, six months or a year or so, and we just replenish them. So, all right, now. Let me show you this. This is about two months old, this microworm culture. It's getting kind of gross. Uh, it's starting to kind of get moldy and mildewy. There's still tons of worms in it though. All these. So basically what happens is the lid starts to mold and then it kind of goes down. So it's been molding for about a week. It started a week or two. Um, no, like a week. Um, and if I don't refresh this culture, it's gradually the mold's going to go down and just take over the entire culture and I'll lose it. So before I lose the culture, I want to use this to start new cultures that are kind of, you know, mold free. Now, normally I start this as soon as I see the first little bits of mold in, you know, starting to develop in the culture. Um, I've let this go a little too long, but there's still plenty of worms in it. It's going to be fine. It's not to the point that it's stinky yet. But what happens if you let them go too long is they go rancid and they reek. They just smell so bad. Or worse, if you let them go and this thing just gets full of mold, then when you take off the lid, like this cloud of mold spores are just going to pop out of it. So generally when I first notice the mold is when I will um, restart a fresh culture from the old one. All right, so basically how I do this this is different from most people. I don't use oatmeal. I use Rice Krispie treats. Or not treats. <laughs> Rice Krispies. And it's pretty simple. The ingredients are Rice Krispies, water, yeast, and then a starter culture of microworms. So, There you have it, that's about an inch, inch and a quarter of layer of um, Rice Krispies in there. Okay, now I'm just going to take some water. Put 
put it in. Usually I have a spoon for this, but I don't know where I put my spoon. So I'm just going to kind of stir it up so that the uh, treats absorb most of that water. And when you're done, what you want it to be like is not really super soupy, um, but just wet enough that there's no dry spots. Okay, that's kind of what you want. In fact, this I think I might have got a little too much water in, so I'm going to add more dry to it. What's going to happen is, so you, you just don't want any wet spots, right? When you start this culture, you're going to want to check it in two, three days or so because at that point, what will probably have happened is the worms will have started to multiply and the yeast will have been working on this and the culture will start to turn a little bit soupy and you don't want that. You want it thick enough that when you turn it, it like barely really slowly flows okay you don't want to turn it have it immediately flow down like a liquid you want it like a thick enough that it it's kind of more a paste than a liquid so it will flow but it does it super slowly okay that's pretty good okay get all these crispies off the sides not that that's going to really harm anything, but just because. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add yeast, whatever you find for cheap at the store. It could be brewer's yeast, it could be baker's yeast, I, I don't think it really matters, but this here is baker's yeast. From the baking aisle at the local grocery store. And I'm going to put quite a bit in there. So I'm going to, I'm going to really kind of coat this thing with yeast. I use a lot more than most people, but the reason I do is yeast is a mold inhibitor. So you're not going to have mold in a bacteria inhibitor. So you're not going to have like, uh, you know, gross bacteria and mold and stuff growing in your culture if you have a lot of yeast in it. Okay, until it kind of gets old or if it gets dry. If it gets too dry, it'll go rancid and it'll be really apparent because you'll get this really dark kind of fungus or mold or bacteria. I don't know exactly what it is, but it grows all over it. Um, and if it's too wet, it goes sour. So if, it, if you don't, uh, if you let it get too liquidy, too soupy, it'll go real sour real quick. So that's why in a few days check if it's gone a little liquidy, which it usually does when it first starts breaking down, then you'll want to um, add some more of the dry Rice Krispies, kind of stir them in until you get the right consistency. Then once you get that, in another few days you might have to do it again, but after that it's pretty stable. There might be every now and then a little bit of texture management <laughs> to keep it up, but often once you've got it, once it's kind of all broken down and you've got the right texture, it usually stays right about there, okay? So I'm just gonna stir that in. And sprinkle a little more on the top. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna take a little bit of this old culture and put it in the new culture. I like to use these, 99 cent store, oh yeah, because uh, then I can scrape them off each other. So what I'm gonna do So if you notice, it's not real runny. Like it'll eventually do it, but it, it's not super runny. So what I'm gonna do is just grab some of this out of here. You don't need a ton. And throw it in there. And that's it. That's all you need. So, oh, the other thing I should just note is um, whatever lid you use for the microworms, just make sure there's a hole in it that they can breathe through. You can poke pinholes in it. You can do what I did and drill out some holes and then cover them with uh, super glue down like a coffee filter on it. You could stick a sponge in the hole. But whatever you do, make sure that there's holes in there so there's a little bit of air exchange. But hopefully that the pores are small enough that you don't get a bunch of 
little critters, uh, mites and stuff, in, invading, or fruit flies or whatever, invading your culture. Uh, wild critters, you don't want that. You want to keep it, microworms. This is the same for Walter worms, this is the same for banana worms. Same culture style, um, same exact setup and maintenance. So that is how we do it. So I'm going to finish these out and um, yeah, hopefully you enjoy. All right, it is time for the time lapse. So I'm just going to really quick show you guys a time lapse of me just whipping out the other ones throwing in some water, stirring it in, getting the right consistency. Again, that's super important. You don't want these runny or they get really sour and all the worms die. You don't want them dry or you get mold all over the place and it ain't no good. So there's some yeast going in. Stir that up, stir that up, stir that up. And I think we're just about done here and we'll move on to the last of the vinegar ear, eel. <laughs> vinegar ear. Vinegar eel. Man, I can't talk today. Cultures. And uh, get on to that. So, wrapping these suckers up. Ta da! Lids on and woo! We're on to the vinegar eel culture. So, here we go. Some vinegar, some vinegar, some vinegar, some vinegar, some vinegar. Then throw in some pear. Fill them up the rest of the way with water, little squirts of old vinegar your culture, and voila, you are done. Not quite that fast, but close. All right, so we're all done, and um, in a few days, I'm gonna have a bunch of tiny little live food to feed to all kinds of fish fry, small fish, um, even kind of adult fish. So Corydoras love to eat microworms. They'll hoover them right up off the bottom. A lot of fish will eat these small foods. Nothing big, like a full-grown Oscar is not even going to see it, but a bunch of your small little community fish will. Tetras, pencil fish, uh, little pseudomugil, rainbows, a lot of fish with little mouths. Live bears will just go around and nibble them right up. So they're not just for babies. They're good for all kinds of fish. So anyway, Hope you enjoyed that episode of the Fishmonger Kitchen. Uh, bon appetit, and we'll see you around.